All right. Hi. Hello. Episode five. Cambodia. Um, a little bit more of Myanmar because I forgot to show you some things, which was very bad of me. And some traveling and knitting tips. Boom. Um, traveling while knitting. It's not like actual... This is how you knit something. This is like how you can scam your way onto an airplane with your knitting needles. <laughs> so, first off, hello, my name is Grace. Um, you can find me on Ravelry and Instagram as Vanna Um And I've opened a Ravelry group. Oh my god, it's called Babbles Travelling Yarns. Um, and um, yeah. It's just a little small thing just to keep all of my notes. I don't expect, you know, many people to go over there at the moment. But um, if you want to pop in and say hi, I'm going to be putting up an episode thread with all of my podcast notes because I'm going to be putting on links to all the places I travel to, all of the companies I used, uh, just in case you want to do the things I did, which would be, um, I'd advise against some of the things I did. <laughs> but there are some things that I would, you know, totally recommend, um, like the Intrepid Tour to Myanmar. So... I just have a few more things that I forgot to show you because I did spend a lot of money and I was like, oh my God, because I had 10 kilograms to take me around the whole area and it was, I'd got an extra bag by, by like an extra kind of over the shoulder bag for all of my stuff and it was mainly yarn and I was throwing out clothes and making more yarn and then I was like can I just knit another bag can I just like crochet a bag really quick because I don't want to buy a bag <laughs> so in Burma uh, in Myanmar I was um <laughs> all of the guys on my tour group were like you can't be serious that's not the only bag you have I was like yes it is and then I kept on buying stuff and they were like it's never gonna fit in your bag and I was like I'm gonna make it fit in my bag shut up I am queen of Tetris, and I'm a very good packer, but Burmit undid me. She did. She? He? What do they call their country? The motherland or the fatherland? Meh. I don't know. So, but this is my favourite thing. And my favourite colour. It's turning a bit grey there, but it's... A teal blue handmade umbrella bought from the factory where they make everything. I saw the guy make this tip. I saw her, the lady make this paper. She made this paper as well. The whole thing's handmade on old wood. So, I'll show you what it is now. It's so pretty. It's so nice. And look at the underside. Ugh. Oh. I couldn't leave it behind. I couldn't, could not leave it behind. Look at that colour as well as it comes through with the light. Oh, it makes me happy. Anyway, and look, she showed us how they made this clip. Oh, it was just genius. I want to get into woodwork now. Anyway. That's for another time where I have a, a house and a studio and somewhere to make a blade. They only made, they made everything just out of a couple of sticks. A couple of sticks. Nailed together. Yep, I'm just going to wrap a bit of twine around the end and attach it to a pedal on my foot. And then I'm just going to pump the pedal and then it spins the lathe and he's just cutting away. And I'm like, there was like, a, like an outboard motor power, powering my dad's one when he had it. Like, why? Anyway. <laughs> So that was one thing and then, um, oh my gosh, so the place where I got this yarn was Dream Girl Handmade Academy. It was Valentine's Day when I went and she also gave me these two adorable little hearts. They're so cute. So cute. So I'll, I'll just, I don't know what to do with them but they're just so lovely. She just popped them in the bag. She just popped them in the bag. Um. Also, um, I went to uh, the weaving uh, cottage and um, I forgot to show you, I'd got something there because I felt like, oh my gosh, I needed to definitely get something. And this is one of the bags that I got there. So it's such a simple construction, but it's a typical Myanmar bag. So what it is, is, so 
it's a long, basically one long strip about this wide. One long strip, probably about two or three, maybe two meters long. And they get one long strip, and they, this is where they finish. They cut it off from the, um, what's it called, the weaving. They cut it off from the loom, and they just fold it over. Brought it down this side, and then this bit is the bottom structural bit, basically. And they just sewed it onto here, both sides. So it's just one long bit underneath. Genius. So I've been using this now for a long time since my bag was um, broken in uh, Ho Chi Minh and that was just amazing. Oh, I also, oh, one second. So this was a beautiful scarf that I also bought from them because I couldn't leave it behind me. This is a hand woven scarf. And there's like greens, blacks, and it kind of reminds me of tartan, which is so funny, you know, all the way across the world and they have... There's only a certain amount of colours, I suppose, isn't there? It's just really nice. So, I mean, put some lines across there and you've got tartan. So I don't know what to do with this. It's not exactly cold in Australia at the moment. I mean, they're saying it's a little bit cold. It's not. It's not guys. I'm so glad I've not acclimatised. Not yet. I mean, it's going to happen because I'm here for a year, but... I was, like, going to work in, like, a t-shirt and they were all, like, in, like, jumpers and hoodies and scarves. So I was like, what the hell? It's <laughs> fine. Anyway, um, I was thinking I could make um like a bag, a, um a bag, maybe a sweater bag before I go, um to the east coast. I've got two weeks left here before I go traveling again. But I'm actually like, oh my god, I've so much to do before I go. <laughs> so yeah, that's a plan that I might have. I think that'd be a nice idea. I might use um, Nicole from Hugh Loco's uh, tutorial on how to make a project bag. Now I don't have any lining fabric, that's the only thing. I don't need, it's only for me, like, I don't need lining. I do need a zip, I suppose. Oh, more things to buy. All right, I can do that. So, those, oh, yes, oh, one more thing from that um, place that did this, because they made their own paper out of the mulberry tree. Everything's from the mulberry tree. This is a mulberry, mulberry wood, mulberry wood. This is mulberry paper, and they grow them out the back. They get them and they like chop them, they chop them all up and then they pound them, they pound the bark, and then they leave it like in a, bo a bowl of water overnight or for, I can't remember how long it is, a couple of days, and then they go in with, <laughs> it was a long stick with a few nails driven through, and they use it like a whisk. <laughs> <laughs> and they were like cutting it up basically like and then they diluted it and then poured it over a paper making tray which is just mesh with four uh, like a like a picture frame with mesh attached to the back and they pour it on the back of that and they leave it in the water and then they be, they slowly they move it all around they move they agitate it with their hands so that you get an even coverage and then they slowly lift it up really really slowly so that the paper doesn't get disturbed and kind of rush all to the bottom. And then they, it sticks to it because it's such a thin layer and then they leave it in the sun to dry. Amazing, so, if I can untangle it. Oh, not bad, Grace. This, I bought this because it was only like three dollars, but it's such a genius construction. And this is all the mulberry paper. Oh, it's so pretty. It's basically just circles and then stuck together alternately. And then a few strings. They've got a bead. Bead. And then leave it like that. Another bead. Ooh. Another bead. And leave it that. That's been folded in my bag and it's still perfect. So, that's just something nice about that. Honeycomb. Speaking of honeycombs, Marsha, I just watched your podcast. I'm so glad I watched it before I, I did my own because she mentioned me and she's on it. Marsha from the fairy, um, she, she's very little and she's on the Twitch and Stitch podcast and her and her husband, yay husband, we got to see her husband, um, was moving the, moving the hive and um, 
yeah, oh my God, there's <laughs> like bees everywhere. But um, she she's brilliant. She was talking about um, that she's been watching my podcast and I mentioned last week about queuing, about Asian queuing. And um, now I meant kind of Southeast Asian specifically because that's all the only places that I've that I've traveled before. And she spoke about um, Japan being like, bam, they know exactly what queuing is all about. And to be honest, so do Singaporeans. Singapore is the same. They're extremely like on the tram, on the trains. They're like they have two lines and then you have to let everybody else come out. And it's very, very, very civilized. According to Western, according to Western standards, anyway, um, and I thought that was really funny. I was like, "Oh my gosh, I'm, I, yeah, I really, really want to go to Japan. It might be next week, next year, but next year or the year after, I'm also planning on doing the Americas. Maybe with my sister. We'll see, Siobhan. Actually, Siobhan's coming over and doing New Zealand and Australia at the end of this year for next year, so." <laughs> We might have to hold it off a little bit. <laughs> Our family seems to be emigrating and travelling in like waves. Shane came first and then it's me and now it's Siobhan. <laughs> so there's only three of us, so I'm sure we'll catch up at some point. I'm caught up with Shane, so at least, anyway. Um, so Japan, oh definitely, I'd love to go to Japan. We'll see, maybe on our way back. Oh, maybe on our way back we could just pop up. Everybody seems to like go, Japan seems to be a skiing holiday place here. Um, whereas for me, it would be like, you know, the Alps are, <laughs> I've never gone, I have gone skiing in the Alps once, but only as a house swap because it's really expensive or France or Italy or, um, I went skiing in Bulgaria once, brilliant, super cheap. Um, and the snow was incredible. Oh, amazing. Apparently Serbia has really good skiing as well. Note. Um, and they, and it's like fifth, like at least a third of the price is going to the Alps and it's the same quality as snow, possibly even better because they're, they're farther away from the, um, Gulf Stream, which is causing a lot of really, really bad snow in Europe at the moment. Um, climate change. <coughs> Where was I? Right. I got distracted. Oh, Marsha's also doing a, um, she's also opened just a Patreon, Patreon group and I've just signed up. I'm like, yes. I love Patreon. And, um, she's going to be doing, uh, my first sweater um tutorials oh my gosh i'm gonna do it and i've just bought it in in the uk i'm uh, not in the uk i've just bought it bought my sweater my first sweater quantity i know it's in plastic but sh sh it's this is i'm so excited this is these are all american or um oh my gosh why do i keep saying american australian yarns and this is Australian Superfine Merino Clekheaton. And it's delicious, delicious DK weight. I don't know what the colour is. It's Wangata, grown in Australia and made by Wang, Wangarata Wool, wooden, wooden, Woolen Mills. Wooden mills. So it's 130 metres in 50. And I've bought, now that's, that was quite expensive. So I'm going to do the trim in that. I made a little tiny swatch. I want to try and do a cable sweater. I'm going gonna to try and make it up. So, Marta, I'm going to be following your tutorials. So that's going to be like the trim and the cuff and the collar. And then the rest of it is going to be in a cotton, 50% Australian superwash merino and 50% cotton mix. Just because I quite like the drape and it's so soft. I said before I don't like knitting with cotton. I don't like, I didn't like knitting with that other cotton, but it's it can be, it can be made into absolutely anything. And this is, like, oh, delicious, delicious. That's been like washed and blocked as well. So I've got my estimated gauge and four millimeter needles. So that's an on the road project. I think that's not gonna happen for a while. Anyway, oops, I've skipped ahead to Australia. I just couldn't help it. There's so much nice wool here. Nice yarn, oh, it's delicious, right. I was talking to to the camera and I hadn't turned it on. That's really annoying. Anyway. <laughs> where was I <clears throat> oh yes I was I was talking about coming back from Myanmar and I was on a few a few planes I was on two planes and they were both Vietjet uh one was no one was Vietnam Airlines and one was Vietjet and I was on the Vietjet plane and I was knitting away on these socks so they're Hermione's Everyday Socks oh, 
look how cute it is. Um, and then she comes up to me and she goes, oh, I'm sorry, no um, sharp needles on the plane. Thank you. No sharp things, no sharp metal objects on the plane. And I was like, <coughs> oh my God, what am I going to do? Panic stations. <coughs> so what did Grace do? <coughs> they allowed me to bring everything else on the plane. And I keep everything pens and crochet hooks and needles and everything in this. I don't have that many. I didn't have that many. And <clears throat> so they were kind of all in there and what was in here only a little crochet hook. Where is it? Look at it. That's not sharp. Well, I mean, you could totally like ram it in. Oh. But not technically sharp. You could do the same with a pen. So she passed and I was like, excuse me, excuse me, can I? It's not sharp, can I, can I, can I? And she's like, okay. God, she's really weird. Why can't she just sit still and do nothing like everyone else? I was like, I can't, I, you know, I just panic. That's, I'm just really, really addicted. It's dangerous. Anyway, so my bag from Lao. Lick it a little elephants walking in the line. Elephants, elephants. Okay, enough of that. <clears throat> so, bag from Lao. Yarn from Chiang Mai. It's like a cotton esque. No, it's completely not cotton. It's acrylic, 100% acrylic, 200 grams lace weight, I'd say. Definitely. It's tiny. And, <clears throat> excuse me, my cooking or drinking. Black tea again in my in it's not mine it's my brother's mug from New Zealand from Hobbitland I'm sure it's called Hobbitland we've had this discussion so no stop pulling out I don't know where I am on this I this is the last time the last time I I did anything on this was when I was in on the plane like a month and a half ago so this is and I had the pattern on my iPad so thank God but it's a pineapple kind of crochet teal pineapple shawl and actually they look like strawberries don't they they look like I think it's called the Lillaberry shawl pattern on Ravelry and it's a free pattern I think I believe and uh, I did it on size four four millimeter hooks I don't know what that is in American American so it's just lovely and it's really airy and light and I had watched uh, it went viral I think on um, Facebook I believe uh, this girl who crocheted her own wedding gown and I was like I'm gonna do that not hinting not hinting James but you know if the time comes I'm gonna make it all myself weddings are expensive man and if I can get like three or four of these in white job done well, and then like a white slip underneath. Wouldn't be as expensive as the whole thing. Or, I don't know, maybe. <clears throat> Ooh, can't forget the crochet hook. I'm obsessed with this colour. Look, like the yarn is this, almost the same colour as the bag. And then there's this bag that I got in Lao. Can't remember if it's been cut out already. And then there's this. It's all the same colour as you guys. <laughs> I'm obsessed with that colour. Teal, isn't it? Teal. Delicious. Sounds like tea. I think that's why I like it. <laughs> Not. It's still so beautiful. I think it's... Do you think it's like a phase? Are we all into it at the moment? Like orange and avocado colour were in fashion. Orange, avocado and purple, wasn't it? Like a aubergine. Aubergine, which is eggplant and avocado. Like all the bathrooms in the 1980s and... 1970s were like that, I believe. Anyway, so where was I? Oh, I also want to say hello to my mother. Hi, mom. And um, some of the girls in work are watching this as well. They said it's a bit long. Everyone says it's a bit long. Can't watch it in between patients. Ali, you shouldn't be watching this when you're in work. <laughs> so funny. They're like, it's a bit long. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> like, have you ever met an Irish person who can make a, a long story short? I think it might be against my religion. 
it's just the way it is. Mum like puts it on the kitchen and she's like, it's a bit long, so I have to do something else while I'm doing it. And I'm like, okay, that's the point. <laughs> that's what we all do. <laughs> so it's fine. And um, so I want to say hello to those guys. Super, super nice. They probably, my mum probably hears more from the podcast than she does from me because I'm a bad daughter. <sighs> I'm trying to be better after work every day. Um, so I've just got a, um, a, a kind of a temp job while I'm in Perth. After work every day, I try and call her, but she's busy. She's never home to answer the phone and I can't really ring her, land her mobile because, well, I can, I do. I ring your Viber and I ring your WhatsApp. Oh, well. We, it's fine. We talk when we mean to, it's fine. Um, so, yes, Cambodia. So then I got into Cambodia and I have a few tips for Cambodia. I've o I literally only arrived there and I stayed there for three, four days in Siem Reap uh, near Angkor Wat. And then I left because that was all the time I had left and I had given myself, um, unfortunately. Some people have spent like months and months and some people live in Cambodia. Of course, they spend like their whole lives there. So, uh, <laughs> idiot. Um, so I arrived in, this is a beautiful, small little airport. Absolutely lovely. On arrival, you have to queue up for your visa. So you sign in your thing and then it's uh, fifth, I think it's, Fifty forty forty dollars perhaps for your visa there on arrival. Now um, I got given a an oldish note with a rip on it, and I was like, "This is an official. It must be okay. It must be totally fine." Do not accept dirty ripped notes in Cambodia because you cannot give them away to anyone else. You just can't. So I was really stuck with this bloody $50, $50 note, American dollars they use. And um, they use their own currency for um, just giving you change, but it's mainly American dollars. And um, you can get American dollars out of the ATMs and stuff. So I had to wait until I was in Australia before I could exchange this $50 note that the officials, the visa officials had given me. So watch out. They'll try and offload bad notes to you. They're not bad notes, they're still current, like they're still legal, ten legal tender, they're still fine, but they just won't accept them. Um, so then I got a tuk-tuk, tuk-tuk to my little, little, little my little um, hotel. I, bu I booked myself a hotel. It's kind, it's, it was only, I think it was $15 a night and it was lovely. Um, it was nice little private room, double bed, uh, with Wi-Fi, that's all I needed. That's all anyone needs. You know, see people see televisions in a foreign country that you don't speak the language in are almost superfluous, don't you think? Anyway, because you don't know what they're saying, so Wi-Fi is just much better. So I was knitting on these beautiful socks, and I got down to the heel, and I did these two at a time again, with the fish, with the with the heel flap and gusset, uh, with some stitch markers, just to remind me as to when I needed to decrease down and yeah, because it's just picking up the gusset stitches and stuff. You end up with like the wrong, like different numbers on the front and back of the needle, um, so it can get a little confusing. I think I decreased and yeah, there's a bit here. I don't know if you can see this little bit here, where this was actually the, the break on the magic loop method. And um, <laughs> I started decreasing there when I should have been decreasing over here. So awkward. But that's fine, you know. I didn't have any other needles to put it onto. I didn't have the same size needles or smaller to put it onto. So I was stuck. And I managed. Muddle on through, don't we? Keep calm and carry on. Well, that's the English bit. That's the English thing to say. So um, we went. I went to beautiful Cambodia, and I went to beautiful Siem Reap. And in Siem Reap is beautiful Angkor Wat. Angkor Wat is an ancient civilization. Um, so um, it's gigantic. I'm sorry. I'm gonna pop in a little clip of um, me when I was. I hired a bike for the day, and I went and cycled around Siem Reap. I uh, cycled around Angkor Wat. And hopefully it will work. Uh, if not, I'll put it up as a separate video because it's on my iPhone and I'm moving files over onto the iPad to edit them on. This can be... Uh, I've never tried it before. So, if it's going to go in, it's going to go here. Mm. 
Oh my gosh. That was an effort. Hello. Hi. Welcome to Cambodia. Welcome to Angkor Wat. Experience Angkor Wat with me. There's no one else here. It's so lovely. I found, well, there's loads of people in Angkor Wat. Oh my God, too many. But I ranged a bike and I've gone off the trail. So hopefully no one else will spot this tiny little, tiny little table I've found. Um, and we will be in peace to talk to myself. I keep hearing these like um, crackles and stuff and I feel like someone's like trying to sneak up on me through the forest. It could be like a tiger, a tiger, an elephant or bear, but it's probably just leaves. That's okay. As long as it stays just leaves. But anyway, so I um, arrived here yesterday and uh, I am, um, I hired the bike this morning for a day two dollars for the day. I had to leave my driver's license though so hopefully nothing happens otherwise I won't be able to drive ever again. Uh, so no that's not true. I'll just pay the money. Um, so this is one of the little temples uh, that are dotted around Angkor Wat and this is one of the tiny 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 ones. Obviously there are ginormous ones and they last, sorry, flies everywhere. They, they go on for miles and miles and miles and miles and miles and um, like, I think that the, the complex is over 32 kilometers, this particular one. And then they've found recently that it goes farther into the jungle, like almost 100 kilometers squared. So I was like, oh my God, not gonna be doing that today. I think I've cycled like maximum 20 kilometers already and I'm like pooped, it's so hot. <laughs> I'm not a cyclist. I don't do that. I don't do the exercising, even though I'm wearing cycling shorts. These are actually my boyfriends that I robbed. I don't have any shorts. Don't have any shorts. Because I lived in Ireland and England, which are cold places, which don't believe in shorts. So I did buy some and then they shrank because of the terrible laundry conditions and everything basically that I brought from home. This might be, I had these shorts and a Harry Potter t-shirt that I brought from Primark. I think that's all that I have. Yeah, because I had my shoes got stolen in Laos, so I have new shoes. I have basically I threw out everything because it was too hot, and I bought everything lighter. And then all of the lighter stuff actually shrank in the wash, so I had to buy new stuff. And there was a cold snap in Laos, so I had to buy warm stuff. It's just a gigantic cycle, and of course, the more wool I buy, the less space I have for clothing. So. I keep imagining that, oh no, but when I use the wool, it will turn into clothing and therefore take up less space. I'm not fooling myself or anybody. But you know what? It makes me feel better, so that's fine. So, um, inside this temple, it's, it's quite small. I walk all the way around it in like four seconds. And inside the temple, there is a headless Buddha. Now, why is he headless? I ask you, asking me. I asked me asking me because I don't know if anyone was watching this, but that's fine. Um, I learned from a little boy who would not stop following me around. I had to be very stern with him and say, I do not need a guide. I am not paying you. Please leave me. And uh, he was sulking. And he left. And I was like, good. Phew. Thank God. Um, but I learned from him what he told me. Um, so is that like, did I steal some knowledge off him? I told him, please, me, please leave me alone. And I didn't see that he gave it to me, really. Um, but he said that um, during the Pol Pot era, Pol Pot era of the Khmer Rouge regime, which was the communist regime, not too long ago. Do you remember anybody? I don't, but I need to learn it. I think it was only in the early, like, 2000s, wasn't it? It's really, 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 really new. Must have been. Anyway, um, they were quite anti-religion and anti-everything. No, just leaves. But um, yeah, so they went around decapitating all the Buddha heads in all the kind of religious sites, which was really sad. 
So it might have been the 80s. I don't know, you guys. Tell me. I'll learn and then I'll tell you again. Probably. Will I redo this? No, I won't. <laughs> so, uh, thank God I'm on a knit row. Otherwise, there's far too much information. Couldn't possibly manage to knit three and then pearl one and then knit. Oh my gosh. So these are still my Hermione's Everyday Socks, which is a free pattern. One Ravelry. I'm not giving away anything. But like, one pearl every four stitches is like way too advanced for me. Like, seriously, I need to concentrate. You know what I'm saying? Anyway. So yeah, I've gone through three of these so far. I feel so bad. Ugh, I, didn't, I, I was hoping to find refill things along the way. Nope. Far too much opportunity to make money selling bottles of water rather than just refilling bottles of water. I had to actually, my little limpet little friend, um, he just like he was eating something and he just dropped the, just dropped the plastic bag right in front of me. I picked it up and I was like, do not do that. It doesn't go anywhere. It's going to stay there forever. He's like, oh, sorry. I was like, hmm. Learn something new every day. Oh, see, he learned something. I learned something. Oh, equal trade. There's a girl I think is going to come down here, so I'm going to stop talking to myself now. I'll see you later. Bye. If not, it's a separate video. <laughs> so keep an eye out for that. Um, it was really, really interesting learning about the history um, of Pol Pot and the regime of the Khmer Rouge. Um, it was extremely, really sad. Um, I I didn't really know much about it, and in the video I said that it was like really, really recent, but actually it was it was in the seventies and eighties, so or sixties, seventies, and eighties. So it was um, basically they took they they turfed everyone out of the cities. Everyone that was everyone that was um academic, everyone that worked in like an office, they turfed them out and said, Go work in the fields, but they didn't give them any supplies. So millions, millions of people died in the countryside without any food, no clue how to grow their own food, no education, no nothing. So people were being killed basically left right and center they have killing fields you can go and you're just tripping over bones i didn't go because i didn't go up, go down to um phnom penh which is the capital city and um it was horrific to think about um like even to the stage where people with glasses were being killed <laughs> because apparently that was a sign of intelligence not that your eyes are crap <laughs> Like it sounded, and it was funny. I was walking around, and someone said to me, "You don't see any old people, or if you do, they're missing limbs." Like, because the country is the most heavily mined country in Southeast Asia, I believe, next to Myanmar, possibly the borders of Myanmar. So, also, I believe that um, the Americans drop more tonnage on Laos and Cambodia than they actually did on. Vietnam because they wanted to stop the Viet Cong moving into those countries to kind of go down the side and hop up into the bottom to attack the American section. Anyway, look into that if you're more interested. I'm not the final word on that. Um, but it was very, very interesting. And I was cycling around and it was beautiful, really, really hot, boiling. So... I saw this beautiful, beautiful sunset and this is me as I was cycling around and it was just gorgeous. This is on one of the moats um, that was dug out. It's a perfectly square moat that was dug out around these temples. Um, it was absolutely gorgeous and it was a beautiful day. It's such a, such a lovely time. And then the next day I went shopping. Shopping. Yeah, baby. Um, and I kept coming across these things. Every time I saw them, I was like, yarn! Look, it's yarn! It could possibly be yarn! But it's not. It's, um, uh, they're hammocks. <laughs> I bought one. These ones are, like, for babies. And then I was like, I want a sturdy one. So I got one of these ones. Um, so... I was so disappointed, but I did find some yarn. I did. I was so exciting. I found the p 
picture. And it's this yarn that I bought. And I bought enough for a shawl, or I thought I did anyway. Um, and then I started, after I finished these socks, cast on these. Now I started knitting a um, shawl called the Anacartis, and then I was like, I'm really confused. I'm just, I don't have the pattern, I'm at the beach, I'm just going to knit socks. <laughs> but I knit opposite socks! Yay! And it, these are for my, um, these are for the Muppet, the Muppet Along cow. I hope that doesn't close. I, I haven't put these in yet. I haven't, I am terrible at doing like joining cows and then never, never like joining them online officially, never entering them. My theory is that you can't ship anything to me if I win. So if I'm, I'm taking, like I might take away an opportunity for someone else. I mean, obviously you can just redraw, but really it's, I just enjoy knitting them and I enjoy knitting with everyone else. So, um, now I knit these on size three, which is why they're not the most comfortable to wear while walking or standing, um, because they're very loose, you know, very loose, but the yarn is perfect. The yarn is so soft. And this bag I also got in the night market in Cambodia and it's lovely. Lovely, lovely, lovely. Silk. Lovely silk. So I still have like two and I'd say a third of each of these left. So I'm going to try and make a shawl. I'm going to try and do something with them. And what are these? These are the needles I did them on. Addies. Addy. Three millimeter, three millimeter addies, because they're the only ones I could find inside these data. And I don't know what to make with these. Does anyone has have an idea that would take 150, 150 ish, yeah, um, grams of fingering weight yarn? <gasps> I could do the Narita Express. Could I? I could, because it's like what one hundred grams of fingering weight, and then extra for the for the border. Oh, <gasps> ooh! I'm sure if I think I'm gonna run out, I'll just. Can I just not do a repeat or something? It's an applied border, so you just I suppose I've never done an applied border. I've never done lace. Technically, I have done lace now, but I tested it and then ripped it out because I didn't like the way it was knitting up. But... So these are my Cambodia socks and I have something made and I have some left over and I'm going to make more and I love these colours and everything's great in life. So that's wonderful. So that was incredible. And then, right, I'm completely gone off script. No scripting happening here. So I spent a lot of money just getting clothes and things because I'd ruined all of my clothes. And then I was like, do you know what? Screw this, hang and hanging everything off my back. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna be traveling. I'm gonna be taking a flight from Siem Reap to Bangkok and then from Bangkok to Singapore and then Singapore to Perth. So I need a proper suitcase to put it on the plane and then not worry about it. So I got a purple suitcase for like $20. Great, lovely, perfect. I um, didn't have any problems knitting anywhere. The only only airline that I ever had problems with, they wouldn't let me knit on the plane. They let me crochet, but not knit. Figure that one out. Was Vietjet. That's the only one. Um, I was actually terrified going on, because like, in Singapore, I feel like it's like a more official, not official, but it's an international airport with a lot of people going through, so the security is super tight. So I actually took my these socks off the needles, put them on waste yarn before I went through, and um, I put the needles in my pencil case. Sneaky, sneaky, and no one said anything. And then when I was on the plane, I actually, because I was kind of a bit freaked out by the first time that someone said, no, you can't knit. So I was like, do you know what, I'll ask permission. And I stopped with the girls, and I was like, is it okay if I knit? And they were like, yeah, <laughs> gives a crap. I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I was like, see, I think it, it's entirely dependent on the crew you get, on the security officer you get, if they're in a bad mood, if they're like new and they're worried about getting stuff wrong, you know, they'll be a little bit harsher. So always carry a smile and you'll be fine. <laughs> I mean, if not, um, Mina always says, because Mina does a few travel tips as well, Mina always says bring some wooden needles with you, which is brilliant, brilliant idea. But I don't know, I... I can't seem to find any wooden sock needles because it like the uh, the knit pros uh, that I've been able to look at look they're the only ones that I can see. Um, they are only they they only go down to a size three, which is too big. Um, I suppose you could put them on DPNs. Is that what you do? DPNs. Because I can't find wooden circular needles because I do magic loop and I've never tried DPNs before. I've got DPNs coming to me in the post. Well, with my boyfriend when he's on his way. So that's exciting. Um, yeah, this podcast is a little bit bitty. Sorry, I'm not quite prepared. Next section is going to be on travel tips in Southeast Asia. Things that I have learnt. Don't bring any clothes. <laughs> the clothes you're wearing. <laughs> Bring a pair of jeans, because they're always good to have, because it does, it can get cold sometimes, depending on where you go. Um, like, from the country that you're coming from, if you're in a cold country. So bring them, that's a really good idea. And then, when you get there, just buy everything. Buy elephant pants, buy fun t-shirts, because you'll want to, okay? So their clothes are everywhere, they're, they're pretty cheap. They're not as cheap as in Primark in the UK, because they use slave labour. But most of the clothes that I managed to buy in Southeast Asia were actually made in the country that they were being sold in, which saves on your miles, doesn't it? So that's really good. And they're probably getting, you know, paid the probably... Just, mm, don't know, don't know, but, uh, you know... It's the clothes that's there, you're supporting your local economy. And you want to because they're also pretty. So good, good, good plan. Um, bring crispy spring cleaned dollars when you're traveling around Myanmar, Vietnam and Cambodia. Cambodia especially. I noticed. I only brought like 150 for two months and it was gone by the time I got down to Vietnam. Which was silly of me because um, I needed the most in Myanmar and Cambodia, which were the last two countries that I was in. So, and it's quite difficult to get dollars out um, unless you're going to a really big airport and they'll charge you quite a lot of money. So it's good to have it, good to have them um, and just keep them on you at all times. Um, visas. Now, most of the places that I went, you could, as an Irish person, as a person from the EU, I had no problem getting into. Check before you go. Always check. One place, or two two places you really, really need to do get a visa. Get it online before you go. You have to get them uh, about three months before you arrive in the country, and three months, that three months has to extend to the end of your stay. So, I bought mine in December, and they lasted me December, January, February the end of February, start to March. They lasted me that long. Which was perfect, because that's how long I was going to be in. And they cost about $50 online um, for Vietnam and Myanmar. And what you do is, in Vietnam, you go up, you give in your, your letter that you get, you emailed to you, and they take your passport and then call your name. And you're back. You're back on track, and then that's you out the door. And you pay when you're there. You pay about 50... I think it's $25 for a single entry visa and then 50 for a multiple entry visa. And I needed a multiple entry because I was coming back in after I went to Myanmar. It's, you know, it's just a visa. It's pretty cheap compared to the Australian visas. So, uh, and Myanmar was super, super easy. You just pay $50 online. You get your letter and you just go... You don't even have to go to, like... You just go straight through customs. You just hand in your letter. It's all on. You don't need anything in your passport. They just stamp your passport and that's it. You're free to go. So that was amazing. Really good to do if you're planning on going there. Um, pack light. Like really light. I've said this before and don't bring any clothes. I mean it. Don't bring any clothes. Um, the, the biggest thing that I brought was medication. Just in case. Because you never know... Um, the medications out there might be at a date or, you know, a bit cheaper. And try not to get sick when you're when you're there. Apparently, I've heard that the best thing to do if you get a serious long-term chronic illness is get your insurance company. Always have insurance. 
uh, to transfer you to Bangkok Airport or Bangkok, Bangkok Hospital because it is the best one. Um, especially for it's just it's just brilliant. It's Bangkok or Singapore, um, if your if your if your insurance company will allow you to do that, or try and get moved home. Um, but that never happened to me. Yay! But I did hear about quite a lot of people who did um, get that. Who did that did happen to? So, um, when I was traveling and knitting, so this is travel knitting section. Um, so I've spoken about um, taking your yarn off your it's taking your knitting off your needles, putting on it to waste yarn to go on to to go through security if you're really worried. Um, most of the time, it was no problem. I just let it in my bag and it was fine. It does depend on the airline and depends on the person. It depends on their mood. Um, and on Vietjet, take wooden needles with you. <laughs> they might still give out to you. Bring some crochet in then <laughs> instead. Um, maybe that was just that one girl that was just like, no, no creativity allowed. Anyway. Um, so when I was blocking my stuff, I did a conditioner bath because it was the only thing I had, uh, the only thing I could find was hair conditioner and just rolled it up in a towel, stood on it a couple of times and then laid it out flat to dry overnight. Um, the places where there was high humidity, it was a bit of a problem drying them, but you know, they dried eventually, so it's fine. And if they're inside with um, the air conditioning, they kind of got cold and wet, <laughs> but most of them are socks, you know, so it's not really essential that they block properly. So I, I didn't want to risk, um, making a shawl or anything when I was abroad because I didn't really know how to block it properly, didn't know how to, you know, because especially with lace and stuff, you really need to hard block it with pins and stuff. But anyway, um, I had to be very inventive with finding stuff if I didn't, if there wasn't any specialist knitting shops around, like stitch markers, um, cable needles, uh, you know, things like that. Um, I had to go into a hardware store in Myanmar and I found like little washers and I threw them out actually or I think I might have lost them actually no. but they were tiny 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 do you know the little small little ring washers with their they're slightly they're unmatched they're they're like a, they're just like a circle of wire and then they don't quite come together because they're just for screwing in bolts and stuff so I got a load of them for like 10 cent and they were like why do you need it and I'm like because I do okay I'm knitting they didn't understand a word I was saying I was like this much and they were like Wah? I was like shh shh don't question me uh I used the inside of a pen for a cable needle at one stage and then I stopped cabling because it was really hard I still have to look up how to cable without a needle or yeah cable without a cabling needle apparently you can do that I was like that's magic so I might do that for my cable sweater. Ouch, that hurt a lot. I don't know if that's possible. Oh, I can't wait to do this. But I have to learn how to do it first. I'm doing a baby sweater first. So that was a tip. I think whose tip was that? Mina's. Mina gave me that tip and I was like, I'm gonna do that. So I've just met a girl who's um, pregnant with twins. So I'm gonna try and knit two, two garmenty type things in two weeks. I have half a one done. I can do it. I can do it. So, do you want to see that? I'll show you next week. Next week is going to be all about everything I've knit in Australia. And places I've been in Australia, in Western Australia specifically, all around Perth. So, um, the biggest thing I've noticed about travelling and knitting is that I've inspired um, loads of people to get knitting. Like three or four of my friends have started knitting. One girl in work has started knitting. She went out and bought some wool and she saw me knitting at work. I shouldn't have been knitting at work, but it was a really slow day and I can't stop. It's a problem. It's a problem. And um, it's been really nice. And it's been really lovely to be able to teach them how to do it, how to do different things like magic loop and and things that they never would have talked about. Some people have only ever knit with straight needles before. And I was like, oh, well, you know, this is... A circular needle and they're like it's genius and I'm like yeah I don't lose the needles I can just throw it you know and let it fall and it won't won't fall out you know so it's been brilliant have you um ever inspired anyone to knit um have you have you taught anyone to knit like how did, like 
it's it's just lovely to to do that to kind of spread the awareness of how amazing it is I really like that um so I, I want to say another thank you. Uh, so Marsha mentioned me on the Twitch and Stitch podcast, which was so nice, so sweet. Um, so, so lovely. And also, my mind was blown when Katie of the number 23, Inside Number 23 podcast mentioned me. She's so cool, you guys. Oh, she's so, so lovely. And she was talking about, um, she was talking about how she, um, she, her car got broken into and how she felt and how it was like, just a really scary moment. And because it was her home, because she was traveling in it. Uh, at the time she was traveling around doing shows and I'm like that's it that's exactly it it's just like an invasion of your space you don't feel safe you don't feel it's just really scary and it was just uh, it was nice because she said that I helped her out um on a week where she was really really sick and I'm really really glad that I helped you a little bit Katie I loved what I love watching you and I hate that you're sick and that's really bad I don't like it don't like it when people I like are sick but I'm so glad you're over it and um that you've got your lovely location going on location I'm on a location <laughs> I need a sewing machine for that and a house <laughs> I'll get there I've got plans I keep putting them off by a couple of years now that I'm going to see Japan South America and all these other places I'll have to settle down and work for a bit lads come on I can't do this for the rest of my life um, and Sue and Chelsea, Legacy Knits podcast, they mentioned me as well. They said I look like their friend Tara, and I'm like, awesome. Totes. I get that a lot, actually. I look like people that... Or maybe maybe it's just that I act like her. I'm not sure, but I, I get a lot that, oh, like, did you work here before? And I was like, no, but loads of Irish girls come through here, and some people just look like me. <laughs> um... And they were saying that um, they didn't know how people could just drop everything and just go traveling. You know, how do people do that? And I used to be one of those people that thought that you couldn't do it. Now, I've given up quite a lot to go traveling. I've given up stability. I've given up a job. I've, you know, I've moved away from my family. I've moved to my family to see my family. But I'm going to be moving away again. Um... And I, I put a, I put a very, um, I put a very, uh, difficult situation between me and my boyfriend, um, when I decided to carry on with my plans before I'd met him and go traveling. Luckily that has worked out and he's coming out with me. Now, I'm so grateful that he has decided to do that. Like, you have no idea how grateful I am because this is something that I've always dreamed of doing, you know? I've always, always dreamed of doing it and I've, I put it off for so long between my my first degree, which was a fine art degree, and my second degree. I was, go well, after my first degree, I was going to be like, I'm going to travel the world. Um, and I didn't realise that you needed a lot of money to do that. So I freaked out because it was a recession in Ireland in 2008, 2009. And I just went straight on to do another degree in something useful, which was radiography. And I chose radiography. Actually, my mother helped me choose radiography. Thanks, mom. Really good idea. <laughs> because it's an internationally recognized degree in most English speaking countries, apart from America. Go figure, America. Um, and it's essentially, I can travel and I can work as I go. I can be in, a, in an agency, I get paid really quite well. It is a very skilled job, it's a difficult degree. You need physics, I did physics, luckily, with my art and geography, <laughs> and English, Irish, maths, and a language which was French, um, for my Leaving Cert, or my A-levels, International Baccalaureate. So luckily I had that, and I've also been working in a hospital as I did my art degree, so I, I did have all those things, and I said, do you know what? There's 
I need I need to have something solid that I can always come back to because I want to travel. I want to see the world. I want to have all of my options. I want all the options, all of them. So <laughs> I went and I said, right, so four years. I'm going to do four years in Edinburgh instead of three years in England anywhere because um, I wanted to go home and work in the hospital to get the money together to do it because I didn't want to end up leaving college with loads of debt. So luckily I had a really good job in a hospital as a nursing assistant and in Ireland at the time before the recession it got paid, con well even during the recession it people who were paid, people on the original pay scale were paid quite well. So I worked my little ass off for about four, four months of every year and then I also had a part time job when I was in Edinburgh. So I came out of um, Edinburgh with a degree and no debt, which was amazing. Amazing. And I hear all the horror stories of all the Americans who have so much debt that they can't even breathe. It's just awful, awful. So I'm so lucky. I've got two degrees, no debt. Genius. I love free education. So I... Um, I was like, oh, I'm going to travel after I, I leave the degree. Nope. <laughs> no money. No debt, but also no money. I'm like on the flat. I'm not on the red. I'm not on the, I'm not on the red and not on the black. So I'm just like, no money. So um, I'd got a job um, about four months before I qualified. So I knew I had a job and I decided to go on the Camino between... Because um, I couldn't technically work between my when I'd taken my exams until I got my results. So I went on the Camino de Santiago, uh, which is a 500 kilometer walk or 500, 500 mile walk across northern Spain. It's a pilgrimage. And I'll speak more about that later if people are interested. I can totally let me know in the comments uh, if you're interested in knowing about, a bit more about that. I have so much to say about it. Um, and I got home and I moved everything from Edinburgh to Exeter and I worked and worked and worked and worked and worked and did overtime and worked and did nights and did works and worked and worked. Then I got, I went for an interview for a um, CT position and I worked and I worked and I got it and I worked 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 a bit more and then I worked again and then I worked at nights and I did three, four, on, three on calls a week coming up to the end of my trip but coming up to when I left because I decided I'm going to go traveling. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this properly. And I have to work my ass off to get some enough money to be sure that I'm going to be okay. So it's not just like I dropped everything and left. You know, it's this has been six, seven years in the planning for doing this. To get registered down in Australia, I started registering uh, in February last year. So it took over 13 months for everything to come through with that. And I was still trying to sort stuff out as I was traveling through. So really, it wasn't, it wasn't like a snap decision. Now for my boyfriend, it has been a snap decision because I forced it on him. But no, I didn't force it on him. I said, I am going if you want to come totally welcome but I understand if he can't and he decided yep yeah, I'm coming and so he's after speeding his way through his plans and he didn't have to get registered or anything and to be honest as a as a man as a strong young man he'll get work wherever you know laboring or maybe in the hospitals he wants to try and get some get a job in the hospitals that I'm working in if that's possible which would be amazing so we'll see how we do but for me, I'm not one of those people that can just drop everything and go. I'm not a snap decision maker. I am not. I cannot do that. I have to plan. I have to have all my bases covered. I have to have everything organised. <sighs> Otherwise I get panicky. I get freaked out. And I... Coming up to the last to, to the last run of it, I was dying to go. I was like, oh my god, it's been so long in coming. So long coming, and then of course I started knitting, and I was like, "What am I gonna do? I can't just leave out of my yarn." And then I realized it wasn't very good yarn anyway, so I just gave it away. <laughs> 
And then I said, no, no, I'll just bring one, just bring one set of yarn, just bring one, and that'll be fine. And now look where I am. All of the wool, all of it. So, moral of the story is, life's hard, but life's awesome. Okay, guys. See ya.